True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. We are often in a place where, where everything still feels very unreal. Um, we do know that the truth will eventually uh, come out, that justice will be served. We have personally never met any of the accused. Um, I think we can only suspect that, um, that they wanted that piece of land. That is the voice of Vainant Fanikak the brother of Anisha Fanikak. He's standing outside a courthouse, speaking with SABC News after the arrest and one of the first court appearances of multiple suspects arrested in connection with the disappearance of his sister Anisha and sister-in-law Joey. As the man stands there, surrounded by people with T-shirts and placards reading Justice for Joey and Anisha, barely holding back his tears. He could have no idea the true horror of what was about to play out in that courtroom, the multiple twists and turns the case would take, and how, in the end, justice was a relative concept. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to Episode 78. The murder of Anisha and Joey Funny Kirk. This episode is sponsored by CBS Justice. This weekend's TV must watch will be a brand new episode of, of original true crime series Murder First on Scene, coming on Sunday to CBS Justice. Witness the twists and turns of a murder inquiry through the eyes of specialists, from forensic officers and medical examiners to cybersecurity experts and prosecutors as they battle to preserve crucial crime scene evidence. Five new episodes from the 24th of April to the 22nd of May at 7pm on DSTV Channel 170. A huge thank you to CBS Justice, for sponsoring this episode of True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Sinead Wilhays for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support, Sinead. It really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. If you like discounts, because who doesn't, Head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs, Print Crowd for all your printing requirements, and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for 10% discount and support the show at the same time. You can do the same when you order from Wallpaper Online by using the code TRUECRIME at checkout. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser, and parole officer to listen, and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use to listen. The case I'm discussing in today's episode has been called one of the most horrendous murder cases South Africa has ever seen, and I would certainly agree for a few reasons. The victims in this case went through unimaginable pain and suffering in their last hours and I must warn you that some of the details are very difficult to listen to. I think one of the hardest things to stomach about this case, though, is the clear and blatant disregard for life that was exhibited by several of the perpetrators. As you'll hear, some of them were even involved in other cases of violent crime, and we can consider at least three of them as serial offenders. While most of the blame would fall predominantly on the man who was believed to have planned the murders, almost all of the people involved here seem to be seriously errant individuals. And the interesting thing is, they're all from very different backgrounds. We've got different age groups, racial groups, genders, 
and socioeconomic backgrounds. And somehow, as in some of the other cases we've seen where groups commit crimes like this, they all found one another and went on to commit horrendous deeds together. While Joey and Denisha's deaths were horrific enough, it would soon become clear that for at least two of the perpetrators, these were not their first murder victims. Research for this episode came from many media articles, as well as the episode of Strangers You Know and some court testimony I was able to find. I'd like you to know that NJ from A Crime Most Queer also covered this case on his awesome podcast. So if you'd like to get a different perspective of it, be sure to go and listen to to his episode too. NJ was also kind enough to share his sources with me from his research, which was a huge help in this very complex case. Thank you so much, NJ. So, without further ado, let's get into episode 78. The Murders of Anisha and Joey Fanikak. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Very little information is available in the public domain about Joey and Anisha prior to the time that their names would become public knowledge through their disappearance. Sometimes in such cases, it's difficult to get a good sense of what a victim was like as a person without speaking to someone that knew them personally. But I think in this case, both Anisha and Joey's families so clearly represented what they were about that we almost do know. Reading information about what they were doing in the days before their disappearances also helps to give us a good sense of who they were. And then, there are photographs, especially the ones of them as a couple. And sure, photographs can be posed, but there are certain things you can't fake in a photograph. Things like closeness, and real happiness. Those things shine through in smiles and glints in eyes, easy hugs and affection. These are all the elements I see when I look at photographs of Joey and Anisha together, as well as them with their friends and families. In one photograph of Joey and Anisha, they wear t-shirts. One says, I'm with her and the other one says, she's with me. And the couple were very clearly deeply in love. The picture exudes love. A deep connection and complete comfort in one another's presence. Anisha and Joey married on the 5th of November 2014. Anisha had purchased a plot of land in Moinoy, and it was here among horses, stretches of greenery and farm life that the women made their home. The photographs of the women with their family tell me that they were truly family-orientated people. You can tell the difference between a photo taken because you're at a family reunion and you don't actually want to be there, and you're actually just smiling because someone said, say, cheese. And the type of family photo where those pictured actually do want to be there. They're actually happy to be around one another, missed each other, and aren't thinking about when it would be a good time to go home. Joey and Anisha seem to seamlessly fit into one another's families, and that too is rare. Anisha was clearly an animal lover. There are tons of photographs of her with dogs, horses, and many other furry creatures. There are some words that jump out at me as I look at the few available pieces of information about Joey and Anisha. Love is a huge one. Kindness is another. And happiness is the third. They both look like the type of people you could very easily start up a conversation with and chat for a bit, 
even if you're a complete stranger. And there's a sense that if you meet them again, you'd always be welcomed as an old friend. Love, kindness and happiness seemed to surround the women as they started their life together on the small holding in Moinoy. But they could have no idea that in the very year that they'd married, just 35 minutes away from where they'd lived, a pattern was beginning. Or at least, we think that's where it started. And a woman was about to lose her life. Because although this episode is titled with the names of Joey and Anisha, I cannot completely tell you their story without also telling you the story of another woman, Amanda May Janser von Rendsburg. Amanda May Janser von Rendsburg had only been married to her husband George for four months, when on the 24th of June 2014, she was found shot to death in her home. A completely devastated George told a reporter that they were planning on getting his wife, who was nicknamed Mundy, her new ID document the following week. With her ID still bearing her maiden name, it would be by that name that she would forever be known in media articles and eventually in court records too. Mundy's murder was initially labelled a farm attack. Like Anisha, Mundy owned a small holding on which she and George lived. They also had tenants. One was Natasha Kutzer. The other was a man who ran a panel-beating shop from the premises. His name was Kurs Stradorm. Kurs had been in discussion with Mundy before her death. He was interested in buying her small holding for a handsome fee. In fact, he said, they'd even signed paperwork to the effect. As an added precaution... Stradorm would later tell police both he and Mundy had taken out life insurance on one another to the value of the amount on the offer to purchase. Stradorm said that this was done in case something happened to one of them in the process of the deal to ensure that neither one would be out of pocket. Now, in my opinion, this is a bit of an odd arrangement, but indeed, after Mundy's death, Despite protests from her husband, 1.8 million rand was paid out to Kurt Stradorm. He very happily pocketed the money and moved on to purchase a piece of land closer to Moinoy. But George Janser von Rendsburg had very good reason to be angry that Stradorm was financially benefiting from his wife's death because a witness had come forward. Natasha Kutzer the other tenant on the small holding admitted to police that she'd seen someone running from Mundy's house on the night she was shot. She identified that man as 24-year-old James Satole. Satole worked for Kurs Stradorm in his panel-beating business. The man was a Mozambican national, but had seemingly been living in South Africa for a good portion of his life. Whether or not he was in the country legally is a question that remains unanswered until today. With this eyewitness testimony and the significant financial benefits Stradorm had gained from Mundy's death, police started to put two and two together, and suspicion began to shift in Stradorm's direction. In order to bring a case against him, though, police knew they needed Natasha Kutz's testimony and that seemed to be no problem. She was more than willing to testify, she said. Until she disappeared. Suddenly, Natasha Kutzer, the vital witness, was no longer answering the investigating officer's phone calls. When he went to her new place of residence, where he'd visited her in the past, she wasn't there either. None of her friends or family knew where she'd gone. The woman had simply disappeared into thin air, and along with her, not so incidentally perhaps, so had the case against Kurs Stradorm and James Satole. If police wanted to get justice for Mundy Janser von Rendsburg, they were going to have to find more evidence. In the meantime, Kurs Stradorm moved on 
and he too married. Between 2014 and 2017, Kurs, who was in his 50s, met and married a young woman less than half his age. Mersha van Roy, at 21, was in fact almost 10 years younger than her new stepson, Kurs's son from a prior relationship, Vincent, who was 30. After marrying Mersha, Kurs fathered several children with her, and they all lived a relatively good life on the small holding he'd purchased close to Moinoy, with the money from Mundy Janse van Rensburg's life insurance. But despite this financial windfall, Kurs had continued to run his panel-beating business, and soon it had new premises when Kurs started to rent a piece of land from Anisha van Niekak on her small holding in Moinoy, Moinoy is a small town in the northwest province of South Africa. It's roughly about halfway between Brits and Rustenburg. The town is predominantly centered around platinum and palladium mining. We don't really know what Anisha or Joey's opinion was of Kurs Stradorm, but as far as a landlord-tenant relationship went, they seemed to have a civil arrangement for the most part. Kurs still had James Satorley on his payroll, and the man was often at the panel-beating shop, and James's younger brother Jack had now been added to the mix too. Anisha and Joey would have regularly seen these men on their property. They would have gotten used to their faces and likely waved to them as they headed off for work in the mornings, and the men were arriving to meet Kurs in the panel-beating shop. Anisha and Joey had no idea who these men really were, their backgrounds, and what they were actually capable of. Soon, Kurs approached Anisha with an idea. He wanted to purchase the small holding from her. Initially, Anisha wasn't keen on the idea, and she turned Kurs down. But he was persistent, and eventually she threw a number at him. Two million, and the small holding would be his. To her face, it seems Kurs acted like this would be no problem, because days later, Anisha would casually mention to her brother that she might have a buyer for her land. Despite Kurs's bravado to Anisha's face, though, it will later be revealed that he did not have the money to buy the small holding at that price, and it is perhaps at this point that he began to consider a different option. In early December 2017, though, all thoughts of property sales would be put on the back burner for Anisha as she experienced a personal tragedy. Her father passed away, and her days became filled with the practicalities of such a loss, planning a funeral and meeting with family to make arrangements and console one another. On Saturday the 9th of December, Anisha's family gathered at the small holding to start making arrangements for her father's funeral. The group, immersed in their grief, would no doubt not have noticed the car passing by the property, and they could have no idea that they were being watched. With the initial arrangements in place, Anisha's family left Moinoy and headed back to their own homes in Pretoria. The plan was that Anisha would finalise some things she had to do at work, and then on Monday the 11th, she and Joey would travel to Pretoria and meet the family at the funeral home to view Anisha's father's body and finalise the finer details of his send-off. Anisha's brothers hug their sister and sister-in-law, believing they'll see them in just two days' time. But for Joey and Anisha, that day will not come because although the first set of eyes that was watching have moved on, another set is now unseen, and the Fanikak's world is about to change forever. While Anisha and Joey were dealing with their grief, on the Stradorm small holding down the road, Kuss was putting a plan into place. I would usually save the details of the crime for the trial phase of the episode, but I think that the complexity of the story begs to be told precisely chronologically 
so that you know exactly what was happening behind the scenes, while Anisha and Joey were just going about their lives, completely oblivious to the danger that lurked all around them. Around the same time that Anisha was receiving the devastating news of her father's death, Mersha Stradom, Kursa's young wife, was carrying out an instruction. Kursa's son Vincent was at the time dating a woman called Marushka, and in early December, Mersha had given Marushka a shopping list of items she needed and sent her into town to buy them. The items on the list included cable ties, the heavy-duty type was specified, and duct tape. Marushka duly purchased the items and handed them over to Mersha. Also around this time, Kursa's employee James Satole made a call to a friend of his. The man, Nelson Malate, would later say that James was really vague on the phone when he'd called him to say he had some work for him to do. James referred to the job as piecework, but said that Malate would need someone to help him and that he should come to the Stradorm smallholding and he would get more information about the job. Two days later, while Anisha was still dealing with the initial shock of her father's passing and Joey was doing her best to support her grieving wife, Nelson Malate met up with Satole and Stradorm at the Stradorm property. He'd brought with him a friend called Elliot. It was then that he was informed that the job involved kidnapping two women. Stradom claimed that they were business associates of his. It would be a really easy job, he said, like taking candy from a baby. All he needed to do was secure the women and then transport them to an arranged meeting place. Stradom said that he and his crew would take it from there. Nelson Malate later admitted that he had initially agreed to do the job. The men eventually agreed on 50,000 rand in payment for the kidnapping, but Nelson perhaps doesn't entirely trust Stradorm because he insists on a deposit before he does anything. He also says that he's going to need a gun to ensure the women comply. With the terms agreed upon, Stradorm points out Anisha and Joey's house to Malate. There, he says, is where the women live that must be kidnapped. The next day, James Satole arrives at Malate's home and hands over the deposit. The gun, Satole says, is being arranged by Stradom's wife, Mersha, and as soon as she has it, they'll hand it over too. Vincent Stradom, Kursa's son, would play a pivotal role in filling in the details of this crime and proving its premeditation. He says that on the 8th of December, his father told him and his girlfriend Marushka that he had a plan to take ownership of the Fanikak's land. Kurs told his son and Marushka that he was going to kidnap the women and force Anisha to sign an offer to purchase he'd drawn up. This offer to purchase, of course, detailed a significantly lower purchase price than the two million Anisha wanted. There was no doubt, Vincent says, that the women would not be left alive. The man claims he tried to talk his father out of the plan, but there was simply no convincing course that this was a bad idea. And so, Vincent and Marushka went on about their lives, knowing full well that within the next few days, two innocent women were about to lose theirs. On Saturday the 9th of December, as the Fanikak family gathered at Anisha and Joey's house, Malate and his crew arrived at Stradom Smallholding. The panel-beating shop would have been closed on a weekend, so Stradom could have no idea that the gathering was happening at Anisha's home. Perhaps as some form of insurance, Kurs had hired a third man to add to Malate's team. Moses Rakubu would later testify that he was paid 2,000 rand to go with Malate and Elliot to kidnap the women. Malate was given a gun 
that Mercia had procured, and the three men were given uniforms that would help them to pose as ESCOM workers. The idea behind this was that, dressed as employees from the power company, the men would be able to gain access to Joey and Anisha's home by claiming they needed to check their electrical connections. Malata says that Mersha Stradorm told him that once the job was done and the women were handed over, she would ensure he got the rest of the money. Malate and his crew leave the Stradorm property and drive to the Fannikak smallholding. But there, they find many cars and people. Malate will later call the gathering a party, which understandably Anisha's family takes exception to, as the reason for the get-together was less than jovial. Malate decides that the spanner in the works is a sign. He's not meant to do the job. And after watching the unsuspecting group for a while, Malate and his men leave the small holding and never return. Malate and Elliot never return to Stradom's property either. Malate keeps the deposit and essentially ghosts Stradom completely. He alleges that Mercer would later arrive at his home and demand he return the gun. Now, We'll get into Mersha's claims of innocence later in this episode, but can we just for a moment focus on this woman's involvement so far? At this point, she's 21 years old. She's a mother to young children, and she's putting together shopping lists for items to be used in kidnappings. She's actively procuring illegal weapons, She's negotiating payment terms with hired kidnappers. And then, she turns up at the house of a guy she knows is capable of pretty much anything and demands her gun back. Who is this woman? She's 21. By Sunday the 10th of December, it seems Kurt Stradorm has realised that the old adage of if you want something done right you have to do it yourself, applies, and he instructed James Satole and his younger brother Jack to carry out the kidnapping. Now, I was wondering why Kurs wouldn't have just gone with this option to begin with, and I think there are two reasons. Firstly, Anisha and Joey would likely have recognised James, and probably Jack as well, which may have made taking them by surprise more difficult. The other reason, I think, is that James Satole had already been implicated and linked back to Stradorm in the murder of Mandy Janse van Rensburg. In fact, at one point, James had been arrested and charged. But when the main witness disappeared in that case, the charges had been withdrawn. I think that Stradorm realised Involving the same man in a very similar crime was a recipe for disaster. And he was right. It was. But he did it anyway. Because his greed clearly overrode any concerns he had. And I'm sure Stradorm thought he could just talk himself out of any trouble again, like he had before. Probably more than once. Stradorm leaves his property for the day. He wants to be far away from Moinoy when Joey and Anisha disappear. Brothers Jack and James Satole, armed with Mersha's gun, head out to the Fanikag smallholding. Joey and Anisha are mulling about the house that day, preparing for their trip to Pretoria the next day. Their travel bags are open on the bed. The women are packing as they go about their day. Anisha has arranged to drop off the house keys with a trusted friend she always asks to look after the property when she and Joey go away. They plan to drop off the keys with the friend when they leave the next morning, but they won't get that far. As Anisha and Joey do laundry, pack some clothes and tidy the home in preparation for their trip, James and Jack Satole arrive at their house. The men burst in and hold the women at gunpoint. They force them into Anisha's Nissan X-Trail 
and instruct them to drive to Kur Stradorm's property. I must warn you that the details of what happens next are very difficult to listen to. The savagery inflicted upon these two women is simply unspeakable. But it is important that you know what they went through so that you can fully understand just how despicable this crime was. The details of what happened next are pieced together from the eyewitness testimony of several people, including Moses Rakuba, who despite failing in his efforts to kidnap the women with Malate, was present when the Satoles brought the women back to Stradorm's property. Other witness testimony would come from Marishka Opperman, Vincent Stradorm's girlfriend, and Vincent himself. When the funny cakes Nissen X trail pulled up at the Stradorm's property, the Satole brothers grabbed Joey and Anisha by their necks and dragged them to two separate areas on the property. Anisha is taken into the house, while Joey is taken to a storage container on the property. Moses Rakuba witnesses Anisha being bound with heavy-duty cable ties and her mouth being covered with duct tape. He then witnesses James Satole rape Anisha while Mersha Stradorm watches from the doorway. Moses is handed papers by Mersha and instructed to get Anisha to sign them. Having just been raped, with a gun to her head, and simultaneously having the safety of Joey being threatened, Anisha signs away her property. Marishka Opperman would later testify that she too had witnessed Anisha being raped, and that she had noticed that the cable ties and duct tape she'd purchased for Mersha were being used to restrain the woman. James Satole then tells Moses to check on what's happening with his brother and Joey. Sadly, it would later be revealed that the women were suffering the same fate at the same time at the hands of the Satole brothers. While James Satole was raping Anisha, Jack Satole was raping Joey. When Moses enters the shipping container Joey is being held in, he witnesses this rape. Shortly after, James Satole drags Anisha into the container. The women are bound again, and then Jack Satole proceeds to rape both women again, while Mersha, James and Moses watch. Moses would claim that he found it extremely difficult to watch the scene unfold, and that the obvious terror from the women was more than he could bear, and despite being threatened by James, he'd fled the container more than once during the attacks. Joey and Anisha plead for their lives, and when they're asked for the PIN codes to their ATM cards, they quickly provide them, hoping perhaps that this will save their lives. Meanwhile, cell phone records show that Mersha calls her husband to let him know that the paperwork has been signed. The next call log from Stradorm is to James Satole, in which he instructs the man to kill Joey and Anisha. The cause of death for both women will never be categorically determined, for reasons I'll discuss a little later, and reading through various accounts, there are actually two versions of how Joey and Anisha died. One is that they were strangled and then shot. The other is that nooses were placed around their necks and they were hoisted into the air in the shipping container and essentially left to hang until they were no longer breathing. With all that these women had already endured, I honestly don't know which probability is worse, if any. But considering how absolutely savage the attacks had been up until that point, unfortunately I seriously doubt that these people were concerned about ending their victims' lives quickly and painlessly. Early testimony in this case would allege that Anisha and Joey's bodies had been burned immediately after their deaths, but Vincent Stradorm and Marishka Oppermann would provide an alternate version of how this had gone down. When it was clear that Anisha and Joey were no longer alive, 
James rolls up Anisha and Joey's bodies in carpets and takes them down to a stream on the Stradorm's property, where he leaves them. When Kurs Stradorm arrives at the property shortly afterwards, he and his son Vincent go down to the stream to look at the bodies. Stradorm is allegedly annoyed that James Satorli has just left the victims there and instructs the man to finish what he started. It is at this point that Anisha and Joey's bodies are placed into metal bins. Their clothes are placed inside the bins as well, and additional rubble and kindling is also put inside. Everything is then doused in petrol and set alight. Puss strikes the match that starts each fire, and Mercia, James and Jack watch as the bodies are burned. James Satole then brings another man into the mix, Alex Madal. He calls his friend and tells him to come to the Stradorm's property. Alex is given the victim's bank cards and PIN numbers and told to withdraw cash and swipe for other purchases. He proceeds to go on a spending spree with the cards. Madal will deny he ever knew that the cards belonged to two deceased women. He claims that he believed the cards belonged to James. This, despite the cards probably having the women's names on them, and the fact that he had no problem going way over the amount James told him to withdraw. After many hours of burning, the remains of Anisha and Joey were retrieved from the bins. Larger pieces of bone were smashed with a hammer and placed into bags. The remains were then, at least initially, disposed of at the stream on the property. They would later be moved to a completely separate area off the Stradorm's property near the R-104. On Monday the 11th of December, when Anisha and Joey did not arrive to meet their family at the funeral home in Pretoria, and they were not answering their cell phones, their families immediately became concerned. This was not a casual coffee date they'd missed. It was the viewing of Anisha's father's body and final preparations for the man's funeral. These family-orientated and reliable women would never miss something like this without notice. Joey's brother-in-law, Corbus, decides to head out to Moinoy to find the women. The property is eerily still when he arrives. The couple's X-trail is not there, and the house is locked. Then Corbus hears activity at the panel-beating shop and heads over there. He finds Kurs Stradorm working and asks him if he's seen Joey and Anisha. Stradorm says he doesn't know where they are, but he does have the keys to their house, which he alleges they left with him. Corbus immediately finds this strange. Anisha and Joey only ever had one friend they trusted to look after their property when they went away. He seriously doubted they would have left their house keys with Stradorm. Then Stradorm says that, actually, he's also looking for the woman, because they signed an offer to purchase for the land, and he needs to go to his lawyer and sort out the final arrangements. Again, Corbus hears alarm bells going off when Stradorm claims Anisha agreed to a sale price of one million rand, half the amount she told her family she considered selling the property for, and significantly less than the property was actually worth. Perhaps if Stradorm had left his story there, he may not have entirely incriminated himself. But poor Stradorm just can't help himself. Seemingly wanting to paint himself as the helpful and trusted neighbour, he goes on to explain to Joey's now baffled brother-in-law how the woman had actually phoned him from a strange number and asked him to bring their cell phones. He'd taken the phones out to a local garage, and the woman had been there in a vehicle he didn't recognise, with two other women. This was the last time he'd seen them, Stradorm claims. Corpus thanks the man and leaves the workshop. He calls Joey's brother and tells him that he really feels like something's wrong, and asks that he come out to the property to check the house with him. Deep in his gut, Corbus knew something was not right. Joey's brother arrives at the property shortly afterwards, and the two men enter the house together, 
They see no signs of disturbance inside the house, but they do find some very worrying things. Chief among them is the women's half-packed bags, which are still sitting on their bed. Items they would have needed if they'd left the house for any extended length of time, like their toothbrushes and handbags, are still there. Very strangely, although Stradorm claimed to have taken the women their cell phones, Anisha's phone is still in the house. Anisha and Joey's family immediately suspect that something bad has happened and they contact local police to report the women missing. The first officer on the scene does not immediately find Kurt Stradorm's story suspicious, but of course, he doesn't yet have any background to the case. This will change very quickly, and I must applaud the police's quick action in this case. All too often in cases of missing adults, family members are told to wait and see. Immediate action is not taken because police hope the missing person or people will return. In this case, though, Northwest Police clearly understood that something sinister was afoot. Although it has never been confirmed, I'm pretty sure that the minute police started running some background on Anisha and Joey and realized that one of their tenants was also a man who was very well known in the Rustenburg and Moinoy areas, all for the wrong reasons, two and two fast equated to person of interest status. The very next day, police executed a search warrant on the premises of Kurs Stradorm, both at his shop, at Anisha's property, and his home. While nothing of significance was found at the panel beating shop, his home was quite different. The first sign that something was off was all the cleaning that was going on. It would later be revealed that pool acid and several other chemicals had been used by employees of Stradorm to clean the areas of importance in the case. Police would later say that when they had searched the Stradorm home, they'd also found evidence that led them to believe that the missing women had been held in the house. The nature of this evidence was never disclosed. On the 13th of December, police issue a warrant of arrest for Kurs Stradorm. He's located in the parking lot of a grocery store in Moinoy, and arrested. For two weeks, the man would amazingly claim he didn't even know what he was being arrested for. Later that same day, the Satoli brothers are arrested at their home. Although none of the three in custody are talking, ATM records reveal the transaction on Joey and Anisha's bank cards, and CCTV footage, combined with facial recognition searches, identify Alex Madal a known criminal, as the man who used the cards. He is arrested the following day. By this time, Anisha and Joey's families were already well aware that things did not look good for a positive outcome. The women were still technically considered missing, but when the four men appeared in court for the first time on the 15th of December, it became clear to all that police had little hope for the safe return of the couple. On the same day, Anisha and Joey's burnt-out Nissan X-Trail vehicle is discovered just off the road in Michalisburg. Although exactly when witness testimony started to be fed to police is uncertain, the charges would indicate that someone, likely either Moses, Vincent or Marushka, had already spilled the beans as the four men were charged with murder, rape, kidnapping, robbery, and unlawful possession of a firearm. I cannot even imagine how Joey and Anisha's families must have been feeling at this point. The tale of horror that those charge sheets suggests must have been so difficult to come to terms with, especially since they still had no idea where Joey and Anisha actually were. It would be the search for their remains that would uncover an even deeper and more complicated story, which to this day remains for the most part a mystery. When police were initially searching the Stradorm property, they did find some remains, but DNA testing would reveal 
they belonged to neither Joey nor Anisha. Between the property Stradom lived in near Moinoy, another property he'd previously lived at, and the site at the R104 where Joey and Anisha's remains were allegedly taken to, police found the remains of five different human beings. Initially, after DNA tests came back, the women's families were told that only Joey's remains could be identified and none of Anisha's DNA could be found among them. Sadly, months later, it would be discovered that the results had been misread, and the reverse was actually true. Only Anisha's DNA was identifiable, and not Joey's. The fact that there were other unidentified victims, though, sent shockwaves of horror through the Moynoy and Rustenburg communities. By January 2018, Moses Rakuba, Marushka Oppermann, Vincent Stradom and Mersha Stradom had all been arrested. Mersha Stradom's arrest came only after an arrest warrant was issued and the families offered a reward for her arrest and police publicly requested she come forward. She eventually handed herself over to police, protesting her innocence and claiming she'd been at her mother's house when Joey and Anisha had gone missing. As an interesting aside, Mersha Stradom would be represented by the same defence attorney who'd represented the mother of murdered child Poppy van der Mava. It's at this point that I'd like to address how Joey and Anisha's case would be covered in the media, with particular reference to their sexuality. Clearly, Joey and Anisha were in a same-sex relationship. My immediate reaction when I see headlines or articles that specifically point out that a victim is gay when the crime is not a hate crime is anger. And this happened in almost every article in this case, either in the headline or several times in the body of the article. In some instances, I considered that perhaps the journalist was just trying to point out that the two women who shared a surname were not sisters and were in fact a couple. But then I felt they really could have just referred to them as a married couple, Joey and Anisha, or some such. Then, in my research, I came across several LGBTQ plus organisations that actually accused some publications of attempting to erase Joey and Anisha's gay identity by not mentioning that they were a couple. So I guess there's that to consider too. I still don't feel that they needed to have labels added to their names in headlines and a reference to them being a couple in the article would be more than sufficient to acknowledge their relationship without such references somehow separating them as victims. For me, this type of reporting becomes really problematic when the perpetrator is a member of the LGBTQ community, because then people with homophobic issues find an outlet to spew their hatred and somehow link it to the person's sexuality when one has absolutely nothing to do with the other. Now, This is my opinion as a person who is not a member of the LGBTQ community, but who does consider themselves to be an ally. So really, my opinion on the matter counts far less than someone with an actual lived experience as a gay person. But there it is. Joey and Anisha were human beings, who loved and were loved. They were victims of a seriously horrendous crime. They also happen to be in a same-sex relationship. Full stop, as far as I'm concerned. Despite the speedy arrests in this case, justice for Anisha and Joey would take far longer than it should have to be delivered. Whenever there's a case with so many defendants, there are almost always huge delays. Often the defendants will all have their own lawyers, and if those are legal aid lawyers, they may not be able to represent the defendant throughout the entire drawn-out trial, and with every representation change, more delays happen. In this case, the prosecution would eventually admit to the judge 
that the case was so complex that it was taking far longer than they expected to prepare for trial. Another thing that impacted how long this case took to come to trial was the fact that many of the defendants had simultaneous ongoing cases. In 2018, charges were reinstated against James Satoli and Kurt Stradorm for the murder of Amanda Janssen van Rensburg. When Alex Modal had been arrested, his DNA flagged in the system to five unsolved rape cases, which had been committed between 2008 and 2010 in the Moinoi area. He was charged with these rapes while being held for his involvement in the murders of Joey and Anisha. He was also linked with three unsolved housebreaking cases. While awaiting trial for his involvement in the murder cases, Madal was handed down a life sentence for one of the rapes, plus 15 years imprisonment for each of the other four rapes and 10 years each for the housebreaking charges. I just want to reflect on the magnitude of this for a bit. We already know the remains of at least five human beings were found on the properties linked to Stradorm. So that's at least five murder victims. Plus Amanda Janssen van Rensburg makes at least six. We don't know what happened to the witness Natasha Kutzer in Mundy's case. No one knows where she is. I truly hope she's not murder victim number seven. Then, Alex Madar was found to be a serial rapist, with at least five victims. These are just the ones he could be DNA linked to. Brothers Jack and James Satole raped Anisha and Joey. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that this was not the first time they'd raped someone. How many rape victims are they responsible for? The legacy of horror that these men have left in their wake is just mind-blowing. In March 2018, Anisha's family held a memorial service for her, stating that although the case was ongoing, holding a service would at least see part of their journey concluded while they waited for the trial. Ongoing and multiple bail applications would be made by all accused. Eventually, Mercia was granted bail, but Kurs, Jack, James and Alex were denied bail. Marushka, Vincent and Moses would all turn state witness in order to avoid legal action for their parts in the crimes. Their testimonies would be pivotal in, in securing the case against the remaining five accused. The three who chose to become state witnesses were also left with no choice but to go into witness protection, as Kurt Stradorm was making no secrets about his intentions to take out anyone and everyone that could testify against him. This included his own son, and the police officers investigating Joey, Anisha's and Amanda's case. Investigative journalism program Carte Blanche managed to catch Stradorm on tape, attempting to arrange the murder of a police officer. Even after this footage aired, Stradorm didn't stop his attempts, and reportedly attempted to arrange a hit on the same officer by a prisoner who was about to be released. In the first recorded attempt, Stradorm tells the man posing as a hitman that his wife Mercia will pay him, indicating that despite being out on bail, Mercia Stradorm was still very clearly working with her husband to silence witnesses. Now, I've spoken about three people who turned state witness and were put into witness protection, but there was a fourth, and it's a name I haven't mentioned yet. Wilhelm Loebscher was a young man in his early twenties. The exact nature of Loebscher's involvement, or what he witnessed, is not known. Some claim he'd seen straight on burning Anisha and Joey's bodies, but Loebscher's mother denies this. What is known is that Loebscher and his family were moved to Zanin under the Witness Protection Program relating to this case. And then, in November 2018, Willem Loebscher was killed in a motorcycle accident 
before he could testify. Initially, there were many rumours that Loebscher had been taken out in a hit, and that a taxi involved in the accident had purposefully driven into him and then over him. But Loebscher's mother emphatically denies this, saying it was nothing more than a tragic accident. Despite this, the rest of the Loebscher family were immediately relocated by the Witness Protection Programme to a new and undisclosed location. The trial of the five remaining accused eventually began in 2019, with even more horrific evidence emerging around the suffering that Joey and Anisha had endured before their deaths. And then, as though this case had not taken enough twists and turns, and the families had not been through enough turmoil. In September 2019, a single article appeared in the press, claiming that Kurt Stradom was dead. The article claimed that the man had been found unresponsive in his cell, and that fellow inmates were claiming he'd been poisoned. For days, authorities denied the claims, and eventually, on the 20th of September 2019, they confirmed that Stradorm had indeed been in ICU for several days after taking an overdose of tablets to end his own life. His wife, Mercia, had been called in and told that he was brain dead and given the option to switch off his life support, which she did. Kurt Stradorm, as he'd done for all of his life, had escaped punishment for his horrendous deeds. James Satole. Stradorm's long-term employee and oft-alleged accomplice, stood trial alone for the murder of Mandy Janse van Rensburg. In July 2020, he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. The following month, James, his brother Jack, Mercia Stradorm and Alex Madal were all found guilty of the various charges against them. Jack and James Satole were given four life sentences each. Alex Madal was given two life sentences. Mercia Stradorm was given two life sentences. In passing down sentence, Judge Bam expressed his utter disgust at the vile crime which had been motivated solely by greed. While Mercia had begged for mercy during her mitigation of sentence, stating that she had young children she needed to raise who'd already lost their father. Bam stated that she deserved no mercy, as she'd shown none to her victims. The judge said that multiple witnesses had placed her on the scene and testified to her involvement in the planning, and she was a clear co-conspirator in the crime, even watching on as Anisha was raped and both women were murdered. The families of Joey and Anisha van Niekak, who'd waited so long for justice to be served for the women, felt that these sentences were just. They only lamented the fact that Kurt Stradom had escaped punishment for his role in both Joey and Anisha's murders and Mandy Janse van Rensburg's murder, not to mention the other still nameless victims whose bodies were found on his properties. This episode is being released either late on a Friday or early on a Saturday. And the reason for that is because despite starting research and writing on this case long before I was due to release, this case baffled me. Of all 78 cases I've covered on this podcast, this one just had me stumped. Because the legacy of pain here is like a spider web stretching out across time and space, touching everyone, snagging so many people in its clutches. It would be easy to say that this all came down to the greed of one man, but really, it didn't. Poor Stradorm was bad enough, and who knows how many victims he is really responsible for. But almost every single person involved here was just completely overtaken by their darkness. James Satole, a young man, a Mozambican national who'd likely known Stradorm his entire adult life, 
I'd really like to know more about the relationship between James and Stradorm, because it almost strikes me as far more than an employee-employer relationship. I hazard to say it was almost a mentor-mentee relationship. Then James's younger brother comes along, who was just 18 years old when he raped and helped murder Anisha and Joey. He was alleged to have been involved in Mandy Janssen van Rensburg's murder too, but was never charged because he was a minor at the time. The investigating officer in this case called him one of the only 18-year-olds he'd ever met that was completely without any trace of conscience. Alex Madal, who despite only playing a relatively small role in these murders, was proven to be a serial rapist. And by the way, that's the value of taking offender DNA. Those types of linkages. I've already discussed how uniquely terrifying I find Mercia Stradom to be. Her cold and calculated actions at such a young age are mind-blowing. And again, I'd love to know more about her relationship with her late husband. How did the dynamic of being married to a man more than twice her age play into her psychology? And it is these very questions that had me stumped. Not because I didn't have answers to them, because I likely never will, but because I spent so much time asking myself them. It's a complex riddle of horrific actions by damaged people. And in the end, we need to focus our attention back on what matters. The victims. Amanda Janssen van Rensburg was in her early 30s and just beginning her life with her husband. Anisha van Niekerk was a hard-working, fun-loving, caring woman who wanted nothing more than to spend her time with her wife, friends, family and furry companions. Joey van Niekerk was so deeply mourned by her family that the enormous hole she's left in this world seems like it may never be filled. These three women, all different, all special, all just living their lives, until they crossed paths with the wrong person. And suddenly, their legacies would be forever linked. Had Anisha and Joey's case not come to the fore, who knows if justice would ever have been served in Mundy's case. Had none of this ever happened, the unnamed and still unidentified victims of that man would still be laying on his property unclaimed, unknown, and lost. Where I can, I like to end episodes with the words of the victim's own family members. They are certainly far more qualified than I will ever be to speak about their own loss and who their loved one was as a person. When Anisha Fanikak's memorial service was held, a fig tree was planted in her memory. Part of what I'd like to close this episode with is her brother Vainant's words in his eulogy for Anisha about how she represented that fig tree. The other part of it is a transcribed version of something Vainant said in the Strangers You Know episode about this case. Quote, The wild fig is a unique tree, and Anisha was just as special. Like a wild fig tree's big, dense leaves that offer shade, Anisha also radiated love. Anisha was always crazy about a lamb chop and a beer. Like a wild fig tree, Anisha was evergreen, always ready for a hug, a joke and a smile, and always willing to listen or to help. A fig tree attracts all kinds of bird species and animals that eat the fruit. Anisha loved animals too, 
especially her horses and her dogs. They were her life. Everyone was crazy about Anisha. She was a good friend, a dear daughter, wife, sister-in-law, aunt, as well as an excellent employee and colleague. The year end before they were murdered, we spent a New Year's Eve together. Typically, being South African, we made a bra. We shared champagne together. We swam together at midnight. And if I could do anything again with her, I think about that night. If I could have any other moment with her again, it would be that night, next to the bra, having a drink together, being good company to one another. End quote. Amanda Janssen van Rensburg, Anisha van Niekak, Joey van Niekak, and the unidentified victims whose remains were uncovered during this investigation. Rest gently. Thank you for listening to episode 78, The Murders of Anisha and Joey Fanikak. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Lived Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. <laughs>